don't you think it would be a little bit weird to find out that someone who really did well selling homes or doing loans years ago and then got promoted to regional vice president and you know executive level positions at a few different real estate or mortgage companies, if you heard that they jumped back into doing loans or into selling homes again, you'd probably think, what the hell? Why would they do that? Why would they give up such a cushy job and cushy job title and great pay to jump back into the trenches? We're gonna to talk to someone today who's doing just that, but the reason why is why this podcast is so interesting. This episode's so interesting because it's not what you think, and the opportunity that you'll hear about exists for you as well. So if, if this high-level mortgage executive, my good friend and business partner, Phil Treadwell, if he is giving up all of that to start originating loans again, he sees an opportunity, and once he explains it, once you see it, I hope you understand just how much opportunity, how much upside potential you currently have. But the question is, are you squandering it, or are you taking advantage of it? Well, we're gonna hear from Phil. He's gonna tell us how he's about to take advantage of it, and how you can as well. All right, guys, I'm here with Phil Treadwell, a fellow co-founder of the Industry Syndicate and host of Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. And he has a pretty cool announcement today, something that he's doing after, after really working um, at the, I guess, executive level or leadership level of a couple of different mortgage companies. Phil's doing something that you might roll your eyes at, which I rolled my eyes at when he first told me because I didn't get it. But uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. Phil, welcome back to the show, my friend. How's it going? Man, I'm excited to be back. Uh, I feel like I've made it. You know, I've been in your podcast before, but like you've been like doing some cool stuff. So to come back, like I feel like I'm in the inner circle. Like this is like big deal. I mean, I'm really doing you a giant favor. Yes, is, is what this <laughs> exactly. Is. That's, that's what I was alluding <laughs> to. Definitely. Yes. No, dude. I, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to have you on today because when you told me what your plans are, and what you're currently in the midst of doing, I was like, well, that's an interesting story because when you first told me, I'm like, why the hell would you do that? <laughs> and, then, and then when you elaborated, I'm like, oh, that makes a shitload of sense. Like that, that's really smart. And, and that conversation is going to be super valuable. So I don't want to steal any thunder. Uh, why don't you let everyone know what you're up to, what you're currently doing? Man, I, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to come chat about it. And, and the why behind it, I think, is super important, especially for real estate professionals uh, in the context of evolving in their career and building a business. Uh, so for, for those that aren't quite as familiar with me, uh, 17 years in the mortgage business, started out as a loan officer, as a loan originator. Uh, and the, you know, I had a really good mentor that threw me in the deep end of the pool. Within a few years, I was a branch manager. I was still originating, but I built a branch, uh, grew into an area manager and a regional and all the things that you're quote unquote supposed to do, right? That, that, that career path that you're supposed to be on as a, as a, as a mortgage professional or really any career. And uh, at some point in there, I'd owned a small company and, and sold it and, and did all the things you're supposed to do. Well, the last, really since 2013, uh, as a area manager, regional manager, and, and to what I've been doing here at Thrive, I've been a non-producing manager. And so it's all been me helping other people build their teams, uh, you know, building markets in, in areas all over the country, you know, helping individual, you know, coach originators and whatnot. Through that, obviously started the podcast and, and, and founded Industry Syndicate. And it was a situation where I found myself almost exclusively talking to, working with, and coaching mortgage and real estate pros and love doing that, have a, have a huge passion for that. You know, through a series of conversations, I realized I learned marketing, got good at marketing and had a passion for it because at truth, I was a sales guy. And a lot of salespeople that are pure salespeople, which is a, is probably one of the most important skills, I mean, we can have, let's just be honest. Right. But there is absolutely a difference between marketing and sales, right? Marketing is getting someone's attention and sales is that point where we actually make them a customer or, or close a transaction. And the what I found is so many salespeople 
weren't focused on marketing. All they were doing was just selling, 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 and they would create these stereotypes, right? Used car salesmen or, you know, door-to-door -door salesmen had this super negative connotation. And so I really found a passion for that, but at the core of what I am is a sales guy. And I, I had this cool opportunity at Thrive. They hired me about a year ago. Uh, my title has been national director uh, of sales innovation and strategy. And so I did everything from, you know, manage our, our talent attraction recruiting team to work with marketing technology and, and sales leadership and coaching. And through all that, I found this incredible company that's doing incredible things and realized who I am and what I'm most passionate about is sales, is originating loans. And uh, kind of had an epiphany, uh, Rene Rodriguez and Amplify, he's a good friend and mentor of mine, and I'd been through it a few times. And through that, through, through an interesting conversation, and, and uh, maybe we'll get into that, maybe we won't. But I realized that I'm passionate about sales and origination, and I want to go back into full-time origination, building a branch, building a team, really focusing on the, the transactional side of it. And uh, at first, a lot of people like you looked at me like I was nuts, right? And it wasn't a lot of, I think even people will say, oh, that's really cool and I'd be supportive, but I can kind of see in their eyes of like, why in the world are you taking a step back? Like you've, you've made it, you found someone to pay you to be you. You don't have to originate and you make, you know, make good money. Um, and, and the money is part of it. Don't get me wrong. I don't think anyone has any illusions that the further you get away from the transaction on mortgage or real estate side, the less of the piece of that pie you get. So there is a huge income opportunity there. Don't get me wrong. But uh, what happens is I found this model with the company that I'm at with Thrive Mortgage, where we're not only focusing on what's successful now, but we're also building things for the future on what's going to be successful in the cliche term of a modern mortgage market or a modern real estate market or things like that. And so, um, you know, the, the best analogy I can give is if anybody's seen the movie Ford versus Ferrari, right? They build this incredible concept car to go out there. And one of the guys that's having to help develop the car is at one point having to teach someone else or supposed to teach someone else to go drive it. And that's kind of where I've been is I'm at this place where I feel like I've got a really good hold of what's going to work, what's going to make sense, what's going to be meaningful and valuable to the industry and to realtors and consumers. And I'm kind of having to sit on the sidelines and hope other people actually go do it. And uh, I feel like the best way to honor what I've been trying to teach and the commitments that I've made is is to go do it and show people that I can go from zero to a, a huge number of volume and a family's help uh, by implementing these things. So that's a really long way of saying after, uh, you know, achieving after 17 years, a really cool national leadership position with a company, I'm going to go back and be a loan officer and, and build a branch and, and build a team. I mean, I wish you would have just said that. No, <laughs> <laughs> no um, you're right. When you told me, I was like, I didn't get it. I'm like, why? <clears throat> Excuse me. But it makes all the sense in the world because that is in line with who you are. It's in line with your overall vision of what you're building and what you're going after. And, and that's cool. I mean, if I'm being honest, I still have an itch to build a sales team myself. Um, and, and I have to constantly like go back to my, my core goals and, and everything that I'm trying to do that keeps me away from that because that doesn't align with me, but it, I see it. I'm like, that makes so much sense. It'd be fun. There's, there's money in it. Um, practice what you preach, all that stuff. Yeah. So, so that's cool. Um, I do kind of want to hear about this epiphany moment you had when you were talking to your mentor, Renee, um, when you, when you were like, yeah, let's go. Yeah. So uh, in short, uh, you know, amplify, uh, is a, a two and a half day workshop where you learn how to become a better communicator. And I wish I had a better way to articulate that because that's a super watered down version. What he does for people in those workshops is extremely powerful to the point to where I've, I've gone to several of them. Like I said, he's become a good friend and mentor. And this was during this workshop. I had just given the final presentation of mine at the end and before I had given it, as we, as we were taking some time to kind of build, you know, this talk, I told him, I said, you know, I'm in a position where I don't feel like I have a call to action. 
I have, you know, uh, is, is since I lead our TAC team, our talent attraction team, uh, I could recruit someone. I could get someone to listen to my podcast. You know, I could theoretically bring in a loan and, and refer it to one of our loan officers. Uh, you know, um, as an entrepreneur, I, I have this brewery that I'm building. Like I, there's a lot of things I could do, but I don't have this singular focus. And as a sales guy, that can be tough because as we know, you know, in marketing, if you give people too many call to actions, they don't do anything. And I felt like I was struggling to find my identity at this point in my career. And so I, I gave this talk and we got done. He said, how do you feel about that? And I was like, I, I feel pretty good about it. And he said, you know, I feel like of all the time that you've been in, in Amplify, that's probably one of the best presentations that you've given. But I feel like I'm only getting about a three out of 10 of what you're capable of. And that, that got me really emotional because I, I felt myself holding back. And while I could go through the motions and get an A on the paper, if you will, I wasn't really giving it everything that I had. And there I was, you know, you get some feedback because you become really, really close with the people in the in the audience or in the group, because there's there's 10 of us in the workshop. And one of them is a is a friend of mine who's in the market that I'm in here in, in Dallas. And he's a you know, like a 200 million dollar year producer. He's one of the top in the country. And uh, one of my uh, guys that works for me was one of his very first people. And so we, you know, we kind of knew each other. And he said, Hey, he said, um, do you really think that would have gotten my attention? And I said, well, well, you know, I don't, probably not. Cause it was kind of a, it was a recruiting pitch was kind of the talk I was giving. And I was like, well, you know, probably not necessarily. And he said, I, you know, he said it out of love, but he said, you know, yesterday I was kind of jealous that my old number one is working for you, but man, if you're not going to give everything you have or give your team, everything you have, maybe he's better off working for me. And he said it in a, in, a, in a positive way out of love for me and wanting me to, to really get motivated. And so right after that, as I, as I kind of told everybody that I was kind of struggling with this identity, if you will, of I'm very passionate about this thing, but I don't do it anymore, right? My entire career in business and knowledge base is built on the fact that I was a really good originator and I developed skill sets around that, but I don't actually do it anymore. And I I have, I have some issues even with coaches in our industry who don't still practice or are, are so far removed from it that they forget what it's like, or they don't really know what's relevant on the ground anymore. And so that was really top of mind. And he said, okay, so like, let me ask you a question. He's like, hold your hands out, put your palms up, close your eyes. And he said, pretend you've got the brewery in one hand and the podcast in the other, and you had to give one of them up, what it would be. I'm like, well, I'd, I'd give up the brewery. He's like, oh, okay, well, that was kind of surprising. He's like, all right, you have the podcast in one hand and origination in the other, and you had to give up one of them, what would it be? And I was like, well, I'd give up the podcast, which was very surprised to people in the room because that's been most of how I've built my brand and most of my connections have come through you know, things I've done and people I've met through the podcast. But what they didn't understand at the time is origination was what created the knowledge base for me to even be able to do the podcast in the first place. And he said, okay, he said, now you've got origination in one hand and thrive leadership in the other, and you have to pick one. What is that going to be? And I was like, I don't know that I'm prepared to answer that. And he said, I don't, I don't care. You, you've, got, you've got to pick one. And again, Renee and I are close. And so he knows when the right time is to push me. And in that moment, he pushed me to make a decision. And the other, the other piece of context is our head of marketing for Thrive, who referred me to the company as another close friend of mine, is also sitting in this same room hearing me go through this whole process. And I said, I, I, would, I would give up Thrive leadership and keep origination. And I got really emotional at that because our company is so good. We have incredible owners and, and executives in our company. I didn't, they essentially built a position for me when I came here. And I didn't want anyone to think I was ungrateful or that I had taken it for granted by any stretch of the imagination. But what happened is through that exercise, Renee was able to help me understand that all of these things that I'm doing, that I love to do, that I'm thankful to do, that I'm blessed to be able to do at the core of what created it and what it came from, the trunk of the tree, if you will, was being an originator. And it's been something that's been on my mind for a few years. Like you talk about, I think anybody that's been doing it and goes out and teaches it still has a passion for it. That's, that's why you're good at what you do, Dustin, is you have a passion for real estate and, and teaching realtors how to do it. Anyone that doesn't have that doesn't need to be teaching anyone. So we all struggle with that from time to time. But I did just like you did. I looked at 
what is my mission, vision, and values? What am I trying to accomplish in the industry? What is my why? And one of my big professional whys that you've heard me say so often is I want to help move our industry to a more modern and relevant era. And I'm a young guy who was raised by the old school in the industry. And that's part of why I try to influence the industry in a big way is, is to really move this stuff forward to where that's not the, the white hairs on a round table deciding what's good for our industry, because we all know that's a crock anymore. And I, in that moment, realized I can still honor that commitment. But one of the best ways I can do it is go by being that example that other people can follow as opposed to just trying to tell them how to do it. And that's not the right decision for everyone, but it was definitely the right one for me. But it all came down to, at the end of the day, I, I had to be very, very self-aware. But if I didn't have, like you said, to be able to revisit my core values and the why of what it is I'm trying to do, I'd had a tough time trying to sort through what that meant for me and probably end up more confused than I was beforehand. What would you say is, because I know that the opportunity that exists is a major factor in, in you gravitating towards be, you know, originating loans again. Can you describe that opportunity as you see it? Like, what are, what are people not doing? What are loan officers not doing? And you're like, oh my God, like if they just do these things, they're going to crush it. Like expand a little bit on the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great question. Probably a big question. So I'm going to kind of limit it to a couple of points. I think first we forget that this is a people business and not in the way that, that your audience may think or that, that people may think. We, we've now adopted social media, right? I can remember, and you can remember a few years ago, like we couldn't even get people to adopt social media and, and explain to them why it was so important. And we still have to have those conversations. But it was funny because I just saw a video by a good friend of ours, Alec Hansen, that it was, it was pretty comical because it's true. Someone's like, well, I mean, I posted on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and match.com and my blog, but I'm still not getting the audience that I need. And he says, well, have you tried to like actually pick up the phone and call someone or have you tried to like go meet someone face to face and again he's having this conversation with himself and i think that principle that he's trying to illustrate is very true a lot of people that are very good at creating leads through social media forget that leads in and of themselves don't matter uh, unless you have a close transaction and then you have people that are really good at closing deals but they're not necessarily good at you know uh, adding leads top of funnel in a relevant way, right? We've understood and we could go into all kinds of data around where people's time and attention are and where are the places that you need to be marketing to people to get their attention and, and potential buyers. And people end up on one side of the coin or the other. And I think where one of the big opportunities are is if someone is really proficient at getting someone's attention and converting those into leads and then helping them take that lead to closing cycle, um, again, most people aren't doing both really, really well. And I think that that's a huge opportunity here. I think the other opportunity is that a lot of companies are either so focused on where the industry is going or so focused on where the industry is that they miss the opportunity to focus on both. And that's really, and this isn't a, a Thrive commercial, but that's why I'm at Thrive Mortgage is I've I've worked for some really good companies and I've, I've, I've gotten to see the inner workings of a lot of different ones. And people are either so focused on, hey, FinTech, financial technology is coming for us. We've got to be this big technology automation engine. And so that's what they focus on. Or they say, hey, this business was, is, and will always be about referral relationships. So we're going to focus on our database and we're going to pound the phones. And again, I know it sounds like there's, uh, this polar opposite, but I feel like there really is. And, and it's not about what people say or even the, the scratch and sniff test, but at the core of what most companies are, they're either playing for five years from now or they're playing the game that they did five years ago. And you have to understand that, yes, this is a people business, just like we talked about. You need to have a presence on social because again, I could sit here if someone says, hey, I wanna buy a house in Salt Lake. and be like, listen, Dustin Brome is a stud. He's one of my best friends. We do business together, super trustworthy, has an incredible team. You need to call Dustin Brome. Five years ago, they would have just called you, no questions asked. What do they do now? They start pecking on the keyboard and look you up on social or they look up your website and I'm like, if Dustin's so awesome, why does he have like two reviews on Facebook? 
why does his website look like it's from like 2004? right? That's now the credibility. Like there's this online social credibility. So yes, it is about people and it is about referral relationships and having those conversations. But if you're not doing the other stuff that's relevant to today, right? What do we do when it's say, Hey, we need to, uh, where do you guys want to go eat? Like you were just here in Dallas, right? First thing you did was like, Hey, we, we searched this place. Hey, it has good reviews. Well, you wouldn't have asked me about some place that didn't already have good reviews, but you still asked me about the place. And I think people are getting their heads on one side of this conversation or the other. And where the magic is, is in the middle. Now, it may evolve to something different, but I think we're still, I mean, it's, I guess, the theme of the country. We're so polarized. People think there can't be a combination of both. And we, we so often were kind of ingrained of this is what I think and this is what I believe that anytime someone tries to show us something different, we close our mind off to it. And that's just gotten the habit. And I think in the industry, people are either I'm a database relationship professional, or I'm a technology social media professional. And I think the opportunities in being both. Mm. So what are you going to do differently? Or um, what does your plan look like? So once you officially open doors, you're well, I think you you have already. You, you're officially a loan officer, licensed in the state of Texas and beyond. What are you going to do to generate business? Like, what's kind of your plan for doing that? Yeah. So again, it, it's it's a mix. I'm going to start with throwing the nets from a technology perspective. Uh, whether that's you know one of them is. Uh, I have good friends at title companies and here's a tip for folks leverage other parts of the industry because everyone has different data, like from a realtor perspective, uh, mortgage professionals typically have databases I have two different some things that I subscribe to where I can pull data on production for both realtors and loan officers. Well, the cool thing that my title company partners have is public record information on transactions. So the first thing I did is I asked him for a list of in the county that I'm in, which is about a million people, I asked him for all of the realtors that did at least eight buy side transactions in the last 12 months in this county, essentially two per quarter for the last year in this county. And he pulled the data within minutes, he had a list with all of their information. So for me, I'm now going to create a custom audience on Facebook that I'm going to specifically target to, mainly because if I'm just targeting them, it's way cheaper than if I'm trying to, you know, post ads or boost posts and try to filter out to find the people that I want. It's there, there's, there's a whole conversation I won't get into there. The next thing I want to think about is, okay, in that group of people, which is essentially my target audience, um, and for the record, to back up a little bit, you and I talk about this a lot. We say, okay, what's the um, uh, conversation? Like, what, what's, what's marketing, right? Identify an audience, find out what the conversation or value it is to, to that audience, and then third, pick out the medium that's best to deliver that message to that audience. Okay. I've identified my audience, people that are doing buy side transactions in Collin County. The second thing is, okay, what's the value? Well, then I thought about what are the, the maybe three topics that are most important right now or most relevant in it? One, getting offers accepted. Okay. Two, inventory and supply. And then three, just loan program depth and getting people qualified right? As opposed to just a normal 30 year fixed loan. Fortunately, those three things Thrive is one of the best at, okay? When it comes to uh, getting offers accepted, we have a TBD program, TBD uh, being to be determined. We fully underwrite a customer on the beginning of the transaction, like literally all the way through underwriting. So when they go to make an offer, it's now no loan contingency. They're a same as cash offer. And we track it for all of the loans that go through our TBD underwrite and then go out and make offers, we have a 50% acceptance rate on that. So the first conversation I have with realtors are, are you getting a 50% acceptance rate on your offers? And most of them aren't, okay? When it comes to supply, we have one of the best build, like construction programs, both for builder and developers that the referral partners may have, as well as consumers. We have a lot of conversations around that. Supply is in affordable housing is another part of this conversation. And then we also have an internal credit nurture program and expanded products. And I won't get into all the details of that, but those seem to be three of the most relevant issues. So what am I going to do? I'm going to create content 
that's relevant to real estate professionals around things that I can do that are going to add value to them. I'm going to do it through video. I'm going to do it through video message. I'll do it through some flash briefings and podcasts. And then I'm going to target them on social media. And then when someone has a conversation or reaches out, I'm going to have a real one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with them and find out what type of business to, are they doing and do we align? So often, realtors don't qualify their customers. And I don't mean qualify to buy. I mean, are they a buyer that I want to work with? Right. And lenders so often don't do the same thing with realtors. I'm not interested in working with every realtor or any realtor. I'm looking to work with the ones that we philosophically align in what we're trying to do. And I do have experience in helping coach realtors build their business. There's a value that I want to be able to add as well. And I want to be able to do exactly what you and I talked about in our very first conversation when we very first met, which is the differentiator is I want to be able to walk up to a realtor that I know wants to do business the same way I do and say, hey, I've got this buyer pre-approved. Please go out and find them a home. By the way, I'm really good at marketing. I'd love to talk and see how we'm able to do this together and be able to add more business to you as opposed to constantly saying, let me take you to lunch and show you how good my service is. Let me show you what, what the Thrive difference is. Everyone's doing that. And what I want to do is truly add value. Now, the kicker is a lot of people are going to hear this and think, okay, well, all Phil's going to be doing on social media is talking about Thrive programs. And that's not true at all. Those three things that I'm specifically going to talk about and target people is going to be a fraction of the other stuff I talk about. Me brewing beer this weekend, or the fact that I you know, flew to Amplify, or my family, or the, the broader social media strategy that we teach. Because again, I think we have these people that do one or the other. They either don't talk about business at all, and so they have people's attention, but they don't actually sell anything or these people that no one pays attention to because all they do is freaking talk about their company. So that's kind of one prong of my strategy. But I think something that anyone could do, a realtor could reverse engineer and make that about consumers. And what are the three biggest consumer hesitations or consumer questions or objections record some content and put it out there and then let people organically have conversations with you. That really is the blueprint for any realtor who's wanting to reach local consumers. It's, it's a template. And then you just replace, you know, who you're speaking to and what's important to them. You mentioned something that, um, you know, rather than just saying, Hey, let me tell you about these loan programs that we offer instead, you're thinking, okay, what would a realtor actually want to know and what would get their attention? And you said, Hey, are you, do you know how to get half of your offers accepted? Do you know how to get a 50% acceptance rate on your offers? Cause I can show you how that has nothing to do with, let me tell you about thrives loan program, right. <laughs> but it, but it also does, but you figured out how to hook them. And that right there is brilliant. So like that right there, you just do content around that. You're going to have yeah. agents coming out the woodwork, like 50% of offers accepted. Tell me how. You Agreed. And, and that's, and that's the thing is I don't, I'm not, I don't want it to be clickbait because clickbait, the connotation is you click on it and there's no value there. But my, right. my, my statement is going to be, do you get 50% of your offers accepted? If not, it's let's a have hook. a conversation. Yeah. The, yeah, the other conversation, yeah. The other conversation is, are you having trouble finding homes for your buyers? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's have a conversation. Uh -huh. uh, do you have buyers? that did not get qualified, that are just sitting there? Well, yes, let's have a conversation because free to them, we have an internal program that has, if, if the customer actually follows through, it's called uh, Thrive for Home. If the customer actually follows through with the program, we have 90% of the, those borrowers that end up getting a contract within 12 months. So if you send them to me and they actually participate, 90% of the time, we've got a pre-approved buyer coming back to you to get into a contract. So for me, it's in, in we were getting obviously into the details of it, but for me, I followed the same path that I teach everyone in marketing to do, which is who is your audience, what value or message you want to give that audience, and what's the best medium to deliver that message. And I thought, okay, what is it that realtors through conversations with you and a lot of other friends that I have, 
What are the topics of conversation? What do I hear my loan officers talking about realtors with? What are the things that are relevant, right? Like we, we get so caught up in, hey, we have the best down payment assistance programs and we have the lowest down payment. I don't know of a realtor that really cares how much their borrower is putting down, right? So what does it matter if you have a 97% program or not? Like that doesn't, that doesn't matter. And so I think we, we, with same thing with consumers, we think as professionals, whether on mortgage or real estate side, that the things that matter to us matter to them. And I would say that 75% of the time, that's not the case. So many great lessons there. I mean, you have to know who your audience is and what they care about, not what most everyone in our industry does, not what you want to tell them. There's a huge difference. And, and with any content, any social media posts, any conversations you're having, if you can just keep that front of mind and, and think about what, what do they actually want or need and then deliver it, you're, you're going to, I hate to use the word thrive, but you're going to thrive, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's turning it, into a commercial true. here, Phil, what the hell? Well, and it's, it's funny because I think we, we overcomplicate it. And that's really what I want the message to be because um, someone asked me this because I, I was gone this week. I was in Vegas at a conference. Ironically, like the one time you come to Dallas, like we can't hang out because I'm in Vegas. But during that, this couple of those conversations with people, they asked like, so what are you going to do different? Now, fortunately, I don't think you asked, what are you going to do different? You asked, where are the opportunities and what, what is your plan? Like, what is your, your model? What some people forget and fail to realize is that I'm, I don't plan on doing anything different. What I plan on doing is winning the details. What I plan on doing is being more consistent than the people next to me. I plan on, you know, going and pushing a little bit further, making a few more calls, sending out a few more handwritten notes, doing an extra post, maybe when I don't want to, um, staying a little bit later, reading an extra book. This this business is not as much about the X's and O's. And I, I, I know that we, even you and I are probably bad about putting people on a platform or pedestal that have this really unique way of doing business. But I think both of us are coming at it from, hey, there's no right or wrong way. Look at this person. They're doing something completely different and it still works for them. But where I think most people, both on real estate and mortgage, the, the number one thing that they need to learn is they need to be consistent and persistent over time. And most people just don't do enough work long enough. And most people are right at that brink of being a top producer or a capper or having their own branch or, or whatever your goal may be for the next level of your career, if they would just push a little bit more. Um, or if you're working your guts out all the time, then you may need to get a coach because you may just be doing the wrong things. Like, but for most people, I don't think it's a, a efficiency issue. I think it's just, they're not putting enough work in. I'm excited for you, man. Cause you, you have the blueprint. It's proven. You've been, first off, you've done it yourself years ago. Then you've been training and mentoring other loan officers and agents all across the industry at the highest levels. And they are literally doing exactly what you said and they're thriving, they're growing. And, and I'm excited for you. And I appreciate that. Genuinely. You won me over. I'm no longer rolling my eyes <laughs> at your decision. Um, well, I, don't, I don't, I don't want to act like uh, like I'm on a, a white horse or anything. Um, we obviously <laughs> know in mortgage and real estate, there's a ton of money involved here. Yep. And uh, you know, there's, there's some motivation there too, that uh, while I'm still a young buck, I'm going to go out and uh, go out and make a little bit of it. You're not that young. <laughs> I think so you're, you're like getting just as much gray in, in yours as I am. So I don't know that I'd be uh, laughing too much. I think you're like, what, seven months ahead of me or something like that? Yeah, something. I got yeah. a lot more gray hair in my beard, though. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, showing me what's yet to come over the next seven months or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All things great to do cool. I remember I was in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was going to get a coffee and the damn place didn't have decaf and I was pissed. And I was on a, uh, you and I were voxing back and forth. <laughs> And you were telling me what your plans are. And I'm like, what? Like, what, why would you do this? You have this cushy job with Thrive and you're, you know, this leadership guy. But now it makes all the sense in the world. You have the blueprint and I'm excited for you. And, uh, and, I, and I know that that was not an easy decision to do. And so kudos to you for making that. Um, you know, that, that's, it's a big boy move there, Phil. Big boy move. And I appreciate that. I'm glad that we have... 
everyone heard it in recording. Dustin paid me a genuine compliment. I just <laughs> want to make sure like the, the, the hell, hell hath freezed over. And, uh, and here we are. Either it's genuine or I've gotten really good at acting. One of the yeah. <laughs> No d- jokes aside. Um, it's going to be really cool to watch what you, what you build, you know, you're, you're more capable than anyone. I know. Um, I was having a conversation with some of my agents down in Dallas um, who are thinking about joint ventures or, or, you know, acquiring a mortgage piece to their business. And I'm like, that all sounds good, but I'm going to, I'm going to run this by Phil because nobody knows more about the mortgage industry than Phil, um, which is another conversation we need to have. But um, I'm excited, man. Like, do do you have any goals you want to share or any, any, you know, bold claims or, or goals that you want yeah, to Yeah, like there? the 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 plan and the goal is to go from zero to a hundred million in a year. Mm-hmm. And uh a hundred million in a year is a is a lofty uh feat and goal. Um you know that that puts it in the the very 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 top echelon of our industry. And uh I've my plan is I got the rest of 2021 to really get some some momentum and then go into 2022 and, and really bust it out. You know, a lot of people will roll their eyes at that, uh, especially in our industry, because I know that that's not the, the easiest feat. But I think the difference is so many people are, start out and say, OK, well, you know, I want to do 25 million this year or I want to do 50 million or they, they try to work up and they evolve their team along the way. I'm, I, I'm coaching people and help people that do 100 million plus a year. I'm building my team from the very beginning, like it's a team capable of building and and built to do 100 million in a year. Yes. And again, you know, what's what's the worst that happens? I only do 50 or 75. Like, oops, you know what I'm saying? I, right. I stumbled into a to a, a, a ton of production. So um, that's the rallying cry, and uh, I have full faith that we'll we'll do that. Um, you know, but uh, not that I'm giving my myself a way out, but I think people need. I, I might, one of my favorite quotes is, is the Leonardo da Vinci quote that says the danger for most of us lies not in uh, uh, aiming too high and missing it. It's aiming too low and hitting the mark. Mm. And so I think that a lot of people, and I actually learned that at a, at a mortgage company orientation years ago, and I won't mention the name because I don't want to lose credibility, but um, <laughs> I, I, I've always, I've always kind of held on to that. I'm a guy, let's, let's aim really high even if we don't miss it, that may be higher than if we aimed at a lower goal. And then like, yes, we got that goal. Like, did, did we leave it all on the field? That's profound as fuck, my friend. It really is. Um, that's good. That's good. Um, I'm excited, man. I, I think you can, you can absolutely hit that, hit that mark because, you know, there's a, you're not the first person if you, when you hit a hundred million in production for, for the first year, you're not the first person to do it. There are many others doing it, most of which, you know, and you've kind of, you know, looked under the hood, so to speak, and you, you know how they run their, run their shit. And now like you just have to do what they do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, 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 you know, we'll probably get some, you know, if, uh, when we hit a hundred million, uh, we'll have some people like, Oh my gosh, that's like so incredible even things that I teach on stage now, most all of it came from a book on the shelf over here or a mentor or someone else like you in the industry that I learned from. And I think we make it more difficult. And that's part of the, the uh, peeling back the veil. You can copy your way to the top, right? There's a book, Steal Like an Artist, that talks about content, right? You can watch someone else's content record a video talking about it. And you know, well, that's your content, right? But I think you can do that with everything else. You can look at someone and emulate exactly what they've done and get the same or better results. And that's okay. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are tons and tons and tons of successful people out there that are willing to share their secret sauce. Maybe they don't share every bit of their secret sauce. That's cool. Don't have a problem with it. I'll go to 10 different people and take their best tip. And chances are, when stacked up against someone else, that's probably a better deal. Um, So, you know, we need to have some self-awareness on what our strengths are and what advice we take, but it's perfectly okay to go talk to a bunch of people, find out what they're doing in business and go do the exact same thing. I mean, there's ethical standards and things that need to apply, but there's plenty of business out there for everybody. And there's plenty of room at the top, if you will. Um, I mean, there's a ton of people in both of our industries that aren't doing anything. I think the the, the, the statistic was at least in mortgage, if the top 50% did like 
two extra loans per year, you wouldn't need the bottom 50% or something like that. Um, but the, the point of that is in real estate, that's probably even a bigger statistic. The top 30% may be able to do a couple more year and not need, you know, the bottom 70. The, the point being, there's not as many people out there that are crushing it, especially in social media, right? We see the Facebook version of people's life. We don't see the hundred right. pictures that weren't good. We just see the one that was, and we're assuming that some realtor has a market dominated or that some loan officer has a office or realtor relationship that they don't. And I'm telling people, if you don't hear anything else, I say, go ask. And I'll, I'll tell you, even the subdivision I'm in, I thought that there was a realtor because I see her mailers, I see her signs, I see her stuff online. I thought she was just crushing my neighborhood. And we have hundreds of homes in the subdivision. She's only doing like 10% of the business. Like, I was shocked. And I, I even know that that's the case about like, she has to be at least doing half, right. not even close. And that's encouragement for people is there's plenty of business out there. You can go do what someone else is doing, make it your own. But really the bottom line is just go work a little harder, do a little bit more, focus on a few more details. And that's, that's really the magic formula, unfortunately, or it, fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Right. Very exactly. I think even before that, it starts with a decision. You know, when we're just, mm. when we're setting goals, what goals do we pick? You know, and I saw, I happened to see Tony Robbins when I was in Dallas last week. And one of the things that really stuck out is um, he was talking about our company and the goals we have for a million agents in a hundred countries in 10 years. He's like, you guys are thinking small. Like, are you kidding me? There's 20 million agents on the planet. Um, and and so, and then he boiled that down individually for what that meant. Like we're playing small. It takes no extra energy to set your goal for, for one deal per month or 10 deals per month or 50 deals per month or whatever it is. It takes no extra energy. But when you set that giant goal that maybe freaks you out a little bit, maybe even makes you laugh and you're like, what? You make different decisions, you know, because you have your, your site set on a hundred million in 12 months. You're going to make different decisions than mm -hmm. if you were just going for 20 mil. Absolutely. You know, and it's funny you say Tony Robbins, because one of the first books of his I read was uh, Awaken the Giant Within. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that he talks about in there is about um, making that decision is the very first thing that you do, right? Once a decision has been made, your actions will follow. But we need to be mentally focused or sold on that, you know, and, and two, it's like, oh, okay, well, I've decided that, you know, like I'm, I'm a, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. And there's a verse that says faith without works is dead. And I won't get into the biblical side of what people think that means. But for me, what that means is if I'm made a decision, if I don't actually believe that I've made that decision, I'm not going to go take any action. So a very practical use is if you make a decision in your life, but you don't do anything about it, my opinions, you didn't really make that decision. And so that was something I learned directly from Tony Robbins and was freaking super jealous that you saw him, by the way, because he's like one guy that I have not seen in person that I definitely want to, to hear because he, again, even that concept, while very profound is not complicated. It's not. And that's, that's, that's kind of what I keep telling my people and what I'm even telling myself. This isn't a complicated thing. I'm going to take a few things that I know to be true and I'm going to go do that better than the people around me. And I'm going to focus a little more and read a few more books and add a few more things. Just it's, it's, it's a battle of the details and it's not hard. It's really not. No, it's not. And, you know, I, I think the reason why we set our site so low is maybe we're not a um, hundred million a year in production is so not normal for us. You know, we don't know anyone that does that. Well, how easy is it? or simple, I should say, how simple is it to just go surround yourself with people who operate at that level? You know, I, I remember in real estate when my goal was to make a bum, 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 hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when I hit it, I was like, holy shit, like, uh, how do you, how do you survive on this? You know, like th th this is not going to work for me. And then I started meeting people that make a hundred thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And, and then I have a few friends now one of which I went to high school with that makes over a million dollars a month. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I'm able to spend time with them and go to lunch with them and talk to them on social. And when you're around people that win at high levels, it becomes normal, I guess, or, or, um, it's not so unattainable. It's like, yeah. if, if that guy, and we used to, you know, we used to go do ridiculous stuff in high school together can make one to 2 million a month. Why the hell can't I, you know? Yeah. It, so that. That will help if, if you're if you're having a hard time setting a, a big goal, making the decision that you can do it, you need to meet people that have done it. They're yeah. out there, thousands and thousands of them. Whatever the hell your goal is, I'm sure there's thousands of people. So, you know, some something that I believe at the core, and, and I, I don't want to get too philosophical, but it's in line with what we're talking about. I believe that, you know, everyone puts their pants on the same way, right? And no, nobody's any more or less able to go do this stuff, right? I'm not going to be a a fashion model or an NBA player, but when it comes to business, when it's intellectual things and taking action, we're all pretty much the same. We have choices. We can do the work or we can't do the work. Talents and abilities can, can kind of come and go. However, principles or laws like success principles and, and just laws of how these things happen, those are universal for everyone. If you do this, you get that. If you work at this, you'll be able to achieve that. People really need to understand there's only a few success principles, success laws out there. We just have to figure out how to apply them to our lives. And and a very practical thing is making a decision and following it with action. Just because I made this decision at the end of May and it's 90 days later and I've, I've executed on it does not mean that every moment in those 90 days, I didn't have moments of what are you doing? Have you lost your ever love in mind? Or as I'm trying to do the work, I'm like, this is not working or whatever else. No, but that's part of life. But the decision had been made. There was no going back at that point in time. I could call my boss right now and say, you know what? I've had a complete change of heart. I want to stay doing what I'm doing. And they would probably let me do that. But that's not what I've chosen to do. And so the power in that for people is what if you just made a decision and said, this is where my business is going to be this year or next year. And everything that you did and action you took was because of that decision And you just, I hate to use the word discipline, so I'll use determined. We'll use determination. Let's just say you were determined to do that thing and every action you took around that fell in line with it, even if it was for a short period of time. Let's just say we've got seven days left in August. What if for one week you just said, I'm going to do nothing but take action around that one decision. And then then I'll decide if I want to go into September. And that seven days, then all of a sudden, you said, well, I'm just going to do it for September because I don't know that I can do it the rest of the year. And the rest of the year turned into the next year. And all of a sudden you're like, holy crap, like I can do this. And the whole face of your business has changed. And I, it, it sounds so philosophical, but it's yet so simple. And, you know, when we started this podcast thing, I had bosses that used to tell me like, why are you giving away all the best stuff? Like you're creating competition. You're making your competition better. I truly believe the reason I was okay with that and the reason I'll share every secret in quotes that I have is because people won't do it. And I'm not thinking bad of people, but the difference between you and the person next to you, when you hear the same information at Tony Robbins is whether or not you actually go do it because most people won't. That's it. That's it. Uh, Something that I wanted to share that you that you um, made me think of something that I've been doing for um, just about a month now, I've been using this thing called the elite journal. And every day to start the day, you write down your top goals. What are your top three goals? And then right under that today's top priorities to reach those goals. Mm. It it goes more in detail than that. But if you just write down every freaking morning, what your top three goals are and what you need to do that day to reach them, that will change your life. That will, that will get you doing the things and moving in the direction you need to, to actually attain your goals rather than what most do. Most do, don't even write their goddamn goals down, but let's say mm-hmm. you do like, I write mine down every day. Yep. The whole notebook, write them down every day. You're already a, ahead of most, but then oh, yeah. to actually say, what do I need to do today? What are the top priorities to, to go there? 
that's how you knock out the big goals. And so um, this is just a fun, I like how this conversation's turned this way because it's just, it's exciting because I used to set incremental goals instead of exponential goals. Mm -hmm. And now I see exponential results are absolutely possible in a fairly short period of time. So why not me? Yep. What do I need to do to get exponential results instead of incremental? You know, going from 20 sales to 40, 40 sales to 60 to 100. Well, why not from 10 to 200? Absolutely. 200 to 600. Yep. Like people do that and, shit. And they do do that. And here's, here's the thing. So to take that one step further, the reason that writing your goals down works, because some people are like, listen, just writing your goal down, like, yeah, maybe you focus on it more, maybe it's top of mind. What people don't realize is writing goals down and putting them in memory or positive affirmation, speaking your goals out loud, we're programming our subconscious, right? Like if you have, you know, this, this, I, I, I was, I use underwriting pipeline example the other day. So we'll do that. Let's just say all the loan officers are putting crappy files together and they went into underwriting and they had like a bunch of conditions on it. Well, then all of a sudden everyone started submitting good files in, well, those good files get in and out quick. It's still going to take a while for the bad files to get out of the underwriting queue, but eventually the good files will overtake the bad ones to where everything in underwriting is a good file. Now use that metaphor for your subconscious. You have limiting beliefs, self-doubt, negative talk, but then you put determined statements, you put goals, you put positive things in. doesn't mean all that negative stuff eventually going to go away, but now what happens is your feedback loop. 70% of what we say or 70% of what we hear every day are the words that we say. So if we're talking negative or limiting, that's programmed to back in. Well, then your subconscious is telling you what to say, and it's this vicious cycle. Well, if we start writing our goals down, if we start thinking positive things, if we start reading books, if we start saying our things, you know, our positive affirmations, our goals out loud, we're putting good into our self-conscious, subconscious, excuse me, that then is integrated in the words we say, which go back in, and all of a sudden the loop turns positive. And I, I know that some people are listening to me like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. At the end of the day, it works. If you write your goals down, if you speak them out loud, your subconscious hears them. We all know we only use them, what, 10% of our brains. What's the other 90% doing? Can you tell me that that other 90% isn't moving your body forward because the conscious part of your brain told it to? That's right. We can think differently, but I've seen a lot of people that apply this and they're the ones that go 10 to 200 in a year. And it's crazy. It's so the subconscious, the unconscious, whatever you want to call it. Uh, an analogy that, that I heard that just makes so much sense is your conscious mind. When you're like actually deciding on your goal and writing it down, your conscious mind sets the destination. Your unconscious mind steers the ship. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And guides sure. the ship. Mm hmm. And, and that's why it's, it's also important. And I've seen huge, um, huge growth just since June, when I really dove in and did some intense training on this stuff, it's mystical or magical or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, I mean, it, it is, and it's not like it is because we don't fully understand it. I don't understand the science of how it all works. What I know is my subconscious, it plays a much bigger role in my life than I would like to give it credit. So my conscious mind has to make sure I'm putting as much good in as I can so that it's, in your analogy, steering it in the right direction. And if, if people would just work a little harder, focus on some details, write their goals down, like very basic things, read an extra book, it all take care of itself. It does. Well, I love that, the, that this conversation went that direction because I think that's super helpful for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> I want to be... Uh, you know, respectful of your time. Let's, uh, let's wrap this thing up with the rapid fire questions. Let's do it. Um, last time you were on the show, um, I know we did it, but you know, mm -hmm. people change. So yeah, let's see. my, my questions have changed a little bit. All right, my friend. So either, or you can just pick one or the other. You can elaborate if you choose to, but certainly don't have to, hence the rapid fire. And, uh, then we'll wrap it up with telling people where they can find you and where they can reach out if they need a kick-ass loan officer in Texas or beyond. Um, Facebook or Instagram, 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 or LinkedIn, Instagram, books or podcasts. Ugh. I'm a podcaster and I still want to say books. I, I, it has to be both. Okay. 
Yeah, I'll allow I gotta, it. I, I, I got to have a both. I'll allow it. Well, let me say this. Instagram or podcast? Ooh, podcasts. All right. Um, iPhone or Android? iPhone. Good call. Although you're a PC user. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> although my Mac screwed me up. You so my PC this. got to this recording on time. Yeah, mine. I was like, oh shit, I don't have enough USB ports in my new Mac mini for my microphone. So we had to start this thing late. I apologize. Uh, burgers or pizza? Burgers. New York or LA? New York. How about neither right now? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you on New York though. Um, NFL or NBA? NFL. NFL or Major League Baseball? Major League Baseball. Oh, okay. Uh, mountains or beach? Mountains. Podcasts or vlogs? Podcasts. YouTube or Facebook Live? YouTube. Rich Dad, Poor Dad or Millionaire Real Estate Agent? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uber or Lyft? Uber. Delta or American? Fuck. Excuse me. I don't know if I can cuss in your podcast or not. I already um, did. I already set the table. It's all good. Okay. Um, only American, be- only because Dallas is a huge hub for American. Because you're forced into it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I am forced into it. American or Southwest? I, I, I Before this week, I would have said Southwest. After this week, I will say American. Really? Okay. I had a rough Southwest experience to Vegas and back. Yeah. You know, maybe this is bougie of me to say, but Southwest doesn't have a first class section. So, right. No, I th- see that's the thing is I typically fly first class American and I fly Southwest a lot because it's, it's cheaper. It's a little easier during COVID. They kept all the center seats open. So it's like, it was good. And, and a lot, not a lot of flights were full. Now all the flights are almost completely full. And so I won't, it's not that I'll never fly Southwest again, but if I have to go more than an hour, hour and a half, I won't. Yeah, because it was it was a two and a half hour flight, and I'll never do it again on Southwest. Yeah, I hear you, man. Last one: Gary V or Grant Cardone? Gary V. Nice. All right, where can people find you? Where can they follow you and um, connect with you? Well, since I'm a big Instagram fan, it's just at Phil Treadwell on Instagram. Uh, my podcast, Mortgage Marketing Experts. Uh, you can see a link tree that has all the links uh, at mmepodcast.com. Love it, Phil. I'm excited for you, man. I appreciate um, it. So I got one question for you and then we can go. Oh, tables have turned. All right. When are you going back to uh, selling a listing real estate? <laughs> Never. <laughs> After Never. all this inspiration we've been giving, come on now. Yeah. <laughs> See, I've, you found a company that just has a model that works for you and everything you're trying to do. I have also. And so now I don't need to go back to sales to accomplish what was like the itch that I want to scratch. Yeah. I can accomplish without having a sales team. Absolutely. So that's totally why. agree. Yeah. Good question though. Phil, appreciate you, man. Man, I appreciate you having me on brother. Absolutely. I'll talk to you soon.